Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. Floodwaters overwhelm exhausted homeowners. Well, you know, uh, for my wife and stuff, for sure. <laughs> and Montreal declares a state of emergency. In a landslide shift to the center, France thumbs its nose at Marine Le Pen. Plus, Camille Paglia on sexuality and gender. I want to get the male bashing out of feminism. Talk that's almost guaranteed to provoke. And the Sunday panel imagines the future of women in a Trumpian America. Tonight, there are more boots filling more sandbags, trying to stop a slow, creeping destruction that's eating away at hundreds of neighborhoods in central Canada. Days of rain and flooding have left desperate and frustrated people looking for a way to keep their lives together. In Quebec alone, more than 120 communities are at risk. More than 1,000 people have already been asked to leave their homes. More help arrived today. There are now 1,200 soldiers spread out providing relief. But for inundated small towns, it won't bring back what's already been lost. Katie Simpson begins our coverage. They know the cause is likely lost, yet they don't stop. Days of sandbagging, no match for the falling rain and rising floodwaters. And now exhaustion is morphing into anger. We don't have enough help. I don't know where the army is. So, I don't know what else to say. It's a disaster. Residents here say soldiers dropped a load of sandbags and headed off to the next neighborhood. They're angry the army wasn't called in sooner. It's too late. They're here too late. And they're not even sending them down to help the other people that are still able to save their house. About 80 soldiers arrived in Gatineau this morning for relief operations, part of the more than 1,200 troops on the ground across Quebec. The assistance comes as hundreds have been forced from their homes in the Gatineau region alone. We understand that your house is your most prized possession, but at the same time, uh, the message is your life is the most prized possession. Safety on the roads is another key concern. Highway 50, a major thoroughfare in Gatineau, is partially closed and thousands of federal public servants in that city are being told to take tomorrow off. Across the river in Ontario, the flooding is bad, though closures are not as severe. The military has not been called in, but an army of volunteers has been delivering sandbags. In some parts of Ottawa, floodwaters are already waist deep and could rise even further. While the rain has eased off for the most part, showers and flurries are expected overnight. City officials say the river may not peak until tomorrow. Until the waters recede, these volunteers will keep bagging and hauling in the hopes of limiting the already devastating damage. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Meanwhile, Montreal is in a state of emergency tonight. Most of the city is fine, but some suburbs have been struggling and they need city resources to flow in to protect them from the tide destroying their homes. Alison Northcott has more on that. Houses in this neighborhood were evacuated early this morning. The water got so high it breached a makeshift dike and poured into the streets. And the house was flooding over by a couple of inches every five, ten minutes, it was going up, going up, so we figured we can't stay here. In another part of the city, firefighters carried stranded residents to safety. And with water levels in many areas still getting higher, Montreal's mayor declared a state of emergency that covers the outer boroughs. Among other things, it allows the city to order mandatory evacuations when residents refuse to leave their flooded homes. We can understand some of the frustration. You know, it's not easy when you live a situation where you build your house and you feel that you will lose everything. I understand that. Some who have left are at evacuation centers but don't know where they'll go next. I'm pregnant, so it's like I have two kids, I'm pregnant and nowhere to stay, so I'm really wondering what's going on and what we're going to do. And So I, I really don't know. Right now, I don't even have <laughs> look at the way I am. In my mom's shoes. I have, his, I have her mom's shoes on. 
everything for me is lost. A growing number of Quebec municipalities are under a state of emergency. The military is now on the ground in Rigo, west of Montreal. It's one of the hardest hit areas and it keeps getting worse. The water has been up like uh, over a foot since uh, overnight. Some have been refusing to leave their homes. On voulait pas quitter. We didn't want to leave, we wanted to wait, says Monique Ouellette. But today, the mayor ordered people in some areas out. The fire department will be coming around to evacuate people. And if there is any uh, resistance, uh, the provincial police will follow the fire department and actually remove the people if they need be. It was hard for Michel Damour to give up. At one point you get fed up after three weeks, almost a month now. I'm just fed up to, to, to fight that. The situation continues to deteriorate in some areas where patience has worn thin and frustration is mounting. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The Prime Minister visited a flood-affected zone in Quebec today. Justin Trudeau tweeted out these pictures from Terrasse Vaudreuil, southwest of Montreal. He met with first responders and volunteers, thanking them for shoring up their community in a time of need. In New Brunswick, the heavy rains that dropped more than 100 millimeters in some areas moved on, giving the province a break. Roads were flooded in parts, but passable. Emergency management officials say the situation won't be as bad as originally feared. They are still telling people to keep a close eye on warnings and to stay away from riverbanks. The other side of the country is also battling floodwaters. A deluge of water and mud in the British Columbia interior has been destructive and two men are missing in separate incidents near Kelowna. Mira Baines has the latest. It seems BC's flooding has turned deadly. The fire chief of Cache Creek, Clayton Cassidy, is believed to have gone missing while checking water levels in a river. His vehicle was found still running near a washed out bridge. The RCMP say the search is now a recovery mission. An elderly man is also missing. His home was swept away by a mudslide. He was believed to have been inside. He's a very nice fellow. He's a retired gentleman. He's been here, living here a number of years. Uh, very helpful in the area, really nice. A tactical team from Vancouver arrived last night to try and find him. Around Kelowna, the floodwaters are starting to recede and people are coming home to mop up. Margaret Zombathy says she felt helpless that she couldn't protect her home. It's pretty frightening to watch and the speed that it was traveling through the yards. Like her neighbors, she's pumping water out of her basement. A freezer, washer and dryer um, floating around down there. It's two thirds full of water. Emergency officials say more than 300 people are out of their homes. While waters are receding in this part of the Okanagan Valley, they're creeping up in nearby lake country because of a combination of melting snow and heavy rain. The biggest problem is our, our waste management plant um, filled up over the night and uh, it's now not uh, working. So we basically can't run water because we have no sewer. Weather conditions are expected to improve over the coming days. Even so, people are told to stay away from rivers and creeks. Their banks could be weakened by erosion. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up, Camille Paglia throws down on today's conventional feminist wisdom. Plus, this week's look back shows just how far we've come, or not. You see, the feminine mystique has made us feel it's unfeminine to use our rights. Hmm. Today, France has elected its next president. Emmanuel Macron is the country's youngest leader since Napoleon, a fresh-faced, market-friendly defender of Europe. For those who fear a rising nationalist right, Macron is a dragon slayer. But for others, he's the creature of a crumbling status quo. As Nell Ayed tells us, it's clear the battle for France's future has only begun. The man about to become the youngest president in French history may not have made it this far if it were not for the rise of the far right. Marine Le Pen has always drawn sharp, pointed opinions. Once again, her critics crashed the small town where she voted to warn France against voting for her. The National Front is the end of all of our freedoms, she says. It's the death of our democracy. From the start, this exercise in democracy has been about who could beat Le Pen, who best to stem the populist tide before it reaches the Elysee Palace. 
it was also clear from the start. Her eventual rival would enjoy an advantage. The weight of influencers at home and abroad loathe to see a far-right leader take the presidency. That prospect made this a vote crucial, not just for France, but for Europe and well beyond. Still a difficult moment for voters for whom Macron was not the preferred choice. At the first turn, I didn't vote for Mr. Macron, and I think that it's really important for him just to uh, think about that because most of the people don't think that his program and his ideas can be the, the one that lead France. Millions, though, disenchanted with the old left and right parties did buy into Macron's centrist pro-EU pitch. And just over a year after his movement started, their bet paid off when early results pointed to a commanding lead. Le Pen insisted all along she would win, Donald Trump style, that her populist message had tapped into anger that went undetected by the establishment. Her supporters blamed her loss on the media. All medias were uh, basically singing the same song and, uh, and it, was, uh, it was very difficult to break the mold at this time. For Emmanuel Macron, for France, it has been a dizzying ascent. At 39, perhaps one of the least proven to ever lead France. In one of the world's most recognizable corners, he acknowledged his reluctant supporters and addressed his critics. Ils ont exprimé aujourd'hui Today they express some anger, some dismay, and sometimes some beliefs. I respect them, but I will do all I can during the next five years so that no one ever has a reason again to vote for extremes. Le Pen wished him well, but far from giving up, she called for a decisive political battle. I suggest that we thoroughly transform our movement to create a new political force to fulfill the wishes of many French people, she says. In another corner of Paris, the anger of those who felt entirely unrepresented tonight escalated into clashes. In some ways, Marine Le Pen did not have to win to make her mark. She now officially speaks for millions of angry French citizens who voted for her. Nala Yed, CBC News, Paris. Germany is the next EU heavyweight to go to the polls. That will be in September. And despite strong populist movements there, Angela Merkel's government got a big boost today. <laughs> Merkel's governing Christian Democrats beat their socialist rivals in a regional election in northern Germany, their second big win over them this year. Pro-European Germans had worried that a win for Le Pen in France could spell doom for Merkel and the EU. Also in Germany, the city of Hanover has staged one of its largest evacuations since the Second World War. It's so authorities can remove unexploded Allied bombs left over from that conflict. Some 50,000 people are now out of their homes. That's about 10% of Hanover's total population. Experts will carefully remove or detonate the old bombs. They expect to wrap up in the next day or so. And people in central Florida woke up to a sonic boom this morning. It came from a highly advanced and secret U.S. space plane. The unmanned X-37B touched down at Kennedy Space Center after almost two years in orbit. The plane looks much like a miniature space shuttle, but its purpose is a mystery as the program is classified. They spent three years of their lives in captivity under the control of Islamist militants. Their fate caught the attention of the world. 82 Nigerian schoolgirls abducted by Boko Haram have been freed, encouraging news for those campaigning for their release. But more than 100 are still missing. Here's Lorenda Redekot. And I know that a lot has gone this on. This was the first glimpse of the young women who were held captive by Boko Haram for more than three years. Only some of their injuries are visible. All 82 had checkups. Then later, they met with the president. In a statement, he said negotiations involved Switzerland and the Red Cross. The girls were freed in a controversial move, exchanged for five prisoners, all Boko Haram commanders. The original kidnapping captured the world's attention. Some of their relatives have sat here every day for the past three years, 
trying to keep up pressure to find them. Even if my daughter is not among, we will still join together and pray to God, hoping that sooner or later they will be back. People around the world pushed for their release, including this Nigerian Canadian. That's amazing. I'm like, I'm so excited. I'm like, oh my God. Sonia Amy wrote a song about the girls and kept performing it. But even so, public attention waned. He died off. People forgot. Even during our last concert, I was asking, who knows about, you know, bring back our girls? Few people, you know, raised their hands up. Some of the captives escaped on their own. Others were rescued last year. UNICEF has been working with some of them. They've been held for three years. They've been sexually abused. Some of them have children now. And there are fears they won't be accepted back into society. There's going to be stigma attached to the girls because they've been gone for three years. They've been with these people who are doing so much to harm society. Officials are now working to find the families of all the girls released, which could take a few days. And the story isn't over yet. More than 100 girls are still missing. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. It's all over for the Toronto Raptors this year. LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers will advance to the Eastern Conference Finals. Today's final, Cleveland 109, Toronto 102. The Cavaliers swept the Raptors in four straight. Not a surprise, but certainly a disappointment as Jurassic Park shuts down until next season. Straight ahead, the Sunday panel takes the measure of fact and fiction for women in the Trump era. Hi, I'm Wendy Mesley with The National. Uh, we're doing something special lately, hope you've noticed. Uh, during commercials on The National, we, we go live, we take your questions. So it's partly a trick to try and get you to stick around. Um, but no, mostly it's because we really do want to hear from you. So I'll get you a bit more detail on how that works and how to send in questions in just a moment. But this is it, this is The National Studio. This is where it all happens and where it all comes together. So if you look up, there are, that's, in real estate, they say location, 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 but here it's, it's really all about the lighting. Lighting is our friend, lighting, lighting, lighting. Uh, and cameras, of course. So we've got three cameras manned, womaned by, uh, by actual people. And we've got the, uh, the jib, which is the one that takes the wide shots and swoops around and makes it all appear very exciting. But this is the piece that matters most to me. This is uh, a computer and the whole script, the whole show is planned during the day. So we start, we have meetings nine o'clock in the morning. We have more meetings during the day. What are the stories that we're most interested in? So by the time I'm here or Peter's here or whoever is doing the show that night, um, we've seen nearly all of it. We've seen all of the intros. We know what's going to happen. Of course, it doesn't always go according to plan and there's breaking news and we adjust to that. And that's again where the computer comes in really handy. Sometimes it dies, at which point I die as well. Uh, but we have wires in here. I've always got my phone. I'm watching Twitter. I'm watching other uh, sources for news. Uh, yeah, and so it all goes tickety-boo. Um, my biggest fear now that I've been doing this for a while and figure I sort of have a clue of how to tell a news story or what matters in news is having a coughing fit. So um, it's kind of weird. Anchors don't seem to have human bodily functions normally. We like never cough or hiccup or anything on the air, but it happened to me once. So now I have I have water and I have little lozenges under here. Well, the lozenges aren't here because I'm uh, tonight. Uh, yeah, just to get me past that that moment of terror of losing my voice. So we are going, we're almost out of time for this commercial break, but when we come back in the next commercial break, we're going to be live and we're gonna take your questions and you can ask me not anything, but almost anything about how we make the decisions that we do. And so you can put the questions into the comment section and when we come back, we'll try and answer that and um, maybe we'll both learn something, thanks.
time now for the Sunday Talk, where we tap into the debate of the week. Are women's rights under threat? Donald Trump made two major announcements this week that have left some asking if American women could soon live in The Handmaid's Tale. My name is Alfred, and I intend to survive. The new hit series, based on Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, has people talking. In the radically religious Republic of Gilead, women have no rights, and the male leaders determine what their bodies are used for. You girls will serve the leaders and their barren wives. And some say its popularity has something to do with Trump's America. For too long, the federal government has used the power of the state as a weapon against people of faith. This week, an executive order on religious liberty, allowing church leaders to campaign and raise money for political causes, such as fighting abortion. We are giving our churches their voices back. It could also allow religiously affiliated employers to refuse to cover birth control. Then, on the same day, this. Make no mistake, this is a repeal and a replace of Obamacare. Make no mistake about it. Part of Trump's new health care bill could allow insurance companies to charge higher premiums for pregnant women and rape victims. Shame! 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 It could also cut funding for Planned Parenthood by 30 percent. This is a really devastating moment for women's health. On Friday, these protesters argued Trump's threat to women is real. Is it? And is any of that anxiety coming here? I'm joined by our panelists. Supriya Devetti is a talk radio host in Toronto. Tasha Carradine is a talk radio host and columnist with iPolitics. And Stephen Marsh is an author and culture writer with Esquire. So, Supriya, I'm going to start with you on this one. Is there any serious comparison to The Handmaid's Tale with what's happening to women in America? So, I mean, I don't think we can actually say that, you know, American women are obviously living in Gilead, uh, and, and I think that's a, a, you know, it's a hyperbolic comparison for a reason, but the book also does make the point, as well as many other writers that have been observing this, that situations like this don't just happen overnight. Or you don't wake up one day and all of a sudden all your rights are gone. Generally, your, your rights become eroded over time, and I think whenever you're looking at a country in which you have a pr predominant male legislature and they're guided either by their own religiosity or by the, the religiosity of their constituents, it ends up eroding away at women's rights. And you're seeing that right now, I think, piecemeal with the Trump administration. But to be fair, it is no real difference from any other GOP administration thus far. Stephen, you've been writing about topics like this for a while. Yeah, what I have the, uh, the unfortunate case of having written a book about this and thought about it quite a bit. And I mean, I just think the idea that we're heading towards Gilead, that we're heading towards a fundamentalist patriarchal society, um, if you look at the data, is just kind of ridiculous. Because, I mean, you know, women gain economic power every year. They gain political power every year. Violence against women declines every year. Planned Parenthood came out with its report this January that showed that abortions are as low as they've ever been, but so are unwanted pregnancies. And th their conclusion, Planned Parenthood's conclusion, is that women's sexual health, reproductive health, has, has never been higher in the United States. I'll let you back in in a moment, Supriya, but Tasha, your sense? Well, I think that there's reason for concern that the Trump administration is autocratic, writ large. I don't necessarily think that women are the first line of attack in what the president is doing or thinking. He doesn't like the press. Um, he likes people who think like him. Alternative facts have become, uh, you know, a part of our, our everyday speech. So there's a lot of autocratic behavior by the administration in general. Do I think we're heading towards the Republic of Gilead? No, I don't think that it's going to go that far. And I take Sapria's point, if you want to find a Republic of Gilead, go to Saudi Arabia, where women do not have rights over their own bodies, can't leave their own house. Uh, without a male accompaniment, have to dress in a certain way. Men can take many wives. I mean, you can you can go on and on in terms of parallels with The Handmaid's Tale. Um, but I don't think that the Trump administration uh, would lead the country down a path that absolute, unless it became run by religious individuals. And I don't think that that is what this is about. But I mean, that is what predominates a, a lot of GOP, you know, Congress talk. That is a lot of what Mike Pence has talked about his ideology quite openly. Is that in fact. Um, he is guided by a, a very right-wing view of Christianity. So it's not as if to say that this isn't happening at all. And I would say that any country that has a, you know, a, a, a mass population in which they don't have access to higher education, post-secondary education, and they're guided by 
by religion is never going to make for a great society for either women or children. Yeah, well, the Christian Coalition um, developed in the United States in the 1980s. Yeah. The Christian Coalition and Ralph Reed and that movement informed the Republican Party to a great degree, there's no question. But you saw pendulum swings also back under different administrations. I don't think the Trump administration is going to take the country down under its, under its, uh, its um, tenure to such an extreme position. I think there are but people it, who would espouse it, but I don't think that they are going to get there. But it couldn't if it even wanted to. I mean, the, the fascinating thing is that period, the Reagan-Bush years, so like 1980 mm -hmm. to 1992, the years of what Susan Flutie called the backlash, that was the years of the most rapid closing of the pay gap in history. Right? The, the forces that are affecting gender are absolutely out of the control of whoever is elected. I mean, really, like, and that, that, the trends that I we're mean, talking... I defunding parent, pa Planned Parenthood well, is yeah. pretty right Look, up there. I, like, I, like, I, like, eroding abortion rights at the state level is right up there. Putting in fetal heartbeat bills at the state level are right yes. up there. That's Look, very I, easy. I, I'm not saying that there's no reason to be... I'm not, I'm not saying there's no reason to be a fearful. I'm not saying there's no danger here. There is an immense danger here. But I think, to the, you know, the Gilead thing, like, you wake up every morning and there's another magazine piece, like it was Red Book, New York, mm -hmm. and so on comparing yeah. it to Gilead. And you know, Gilead is a fundamentalist patriarchal society. And the truth of the matter is, we're not going anywhere near that. We're actually devolving well, into a completely I, new kind of misogyny. So, I mean, I don't disagree with that, but if we're only holding up Gilead as our bar for what? Well, well, at least we're not Gilead, <laughs> no, 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 we're but okay. I think, or you know, the, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. But the conceit, the, conceit of, the brilliance of The Handmaid's Tale as a novel is that it was a science fiction novel about the past, right? Mm. Everything that had happened, everything that happened in the book had actually happened right. to women or was happening to women at the same time. So, but the, 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 the consequence of that is that it's a book about the past. And when you look at the future, when you look at where the future is going, it's not going to Gilead. And that's why I think it's actually these comparisons are not helpful. I, mean, like, I would agree with that. Donald Trump is not the I commander. Agree. I think it's. I think well, the, the the Handmaid's Tale is a brilliant novel, and it is a cautionary tale in many ways. But it's hyperbole to suggest that that's where things are going. And I think the backlash you were referring to is actually when people see that language being used, people on the right and people uh, who are people of faith will naturally rebel against that, and it actually makes things worse. But what do you for say women. to Supriya's argument that there has been change? That, for example, it is becoming much more difficult to get an abortion in many states. Uh, restrictions on abortion rights obviously will compromise women's rights but that is not a, a, like I said that is not that the Trump administration is behind all those individual states that mm. are doing this no, of course the, not. and this is why I'm saying that the United States has checks and balances as well within the party system well, and within the legislative yeah, system we'll and I don't I think that you may see a pendulum swing like I said to that but it also can swing back the other way if if other freedoms are eroded, I agree, freedom of speech, freedom of the media, other things, that can present a situation where those, uh, those, those Real, like a perfect could be storm, worse. if you will. Exactly, of, of, and I don't, I don't see that's that. That's not now. the so, storm that's coming. Like the storm that is coming is not Gilead. The storm that is coming, we don't, we don't, we're not, we should not worry about the commander. Like we should worry about the basement dwelling red pillars and their misogyny. That's what's new. And that is not the result of the control of government and economy by men. But there's That's also actually an the result of like the arrival of equality. between those red pillars and guys like Putin and guys like Trump and people that are supporting candidates like with, with the, within the party of the Front National. So there is definitely an overlap within those red pillars and also those who would well, like Front us National to see go back to yeah, run by kind of a dead letter. I mean, <laughs> Front National is run by women. Yeah, so it must be feminist. No, then. but, but like, I, well, I mean, the, the point is that's not the commander. Right, that's not patriarchy. Sure, but again, like I don't think we should be basing this solely on are we at Gilead yet? If not, everything's fine. Just, to, just. No, 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 I just want to, Stephen. I'm going to hold you there because yeah, sure. I just want to move this on. I've been trying to get a sense of whether any of this anxiety, any mm -hmm. of this change, this movement is coming here because we've had some of these debates, not at the same level as in the states. But is any of that coming here? Like the, the, this push that that uh, towards more freedom of speech for religious leaders and closer line between. Uh, religious leaders and government and, and well, politicians. Well, it's interesting so because there have been conversations around um, interest groups, which include religions, uh, religious groups, and the restrictions that are placed on them under the tax code. If you're a charity in this country, uh, you are restricted from political activity. That just doesn't cover just faith. It can cover environmental groups. It can cover anybody who is an activist organization that bills themselves as a charity. So is what's happening in the States, is that encouraging or setting back that? Well, that what, it, what the States is doing is they're saying that religion should be, as a charity, should still be able to lobby. And the irony, of course, is that religion has been lobbying in the United States indirectly all the time. This is simply saying we're going to allow you to be. But I'm wondering what, so. what impact do you see it, if any, having here? I honestly see it having very little impact. The, mm -hmm. the, the ironic thing is that even though the U.S. has much better protections against the, melt, the meddling of church and state than to us, for example, we explicitly refer to the supremacy of God in the preamble to our constitution. Our head of state is also the head of a church. Um, but we are generally, as a society, much more secular. And I think that's honestly what keeps our laws 
much more egalitarian and much more equal, and we don't have the same sort of direct attack on women's rights that we see in other countries. I mean, the question is just how far America is going to go from the rest of the developed world, right? I mean, it is on its own path, you know, you know, not just with these women's issues and faith issues, but with basic issues of government, basic issues of what government does, basic issues of what freedom are. And like, no, I don't think we're, we're on one path and America is going like this. And it's very dangerous to think how far it could go. Well, you're, like, you're uh, assuming it will go there. You're assuming, and everyone, and this is the thing. Oh, wait, it's gone there. I, no, am, I am under well, the assumption that Trump... The, 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 yeah, the I mean, uh, I'm working on the there. basic premise the Trump that Trump is different than us. No, the Trump, uh, I agree. The Trump administration is very different than what we have seen in Canada. It's also very different than what you've seen in the United States. And you can compare his speeches, you can compare his his entire um, modus operandi is extremely different than so any other right leader. Now, there's, so a, I don't there's a conservative leadership either. race happening right yeah. now. And I'm just wondering what sort of impact that may or may not be having on that. We've seen the two candidates who were Trump-esque. Perhaps, yes. <laughs> O'Leary has dropped out yes. and, uh, and, and Kelly Kelly's... Leach is maybe not doing as well as before. No, she's polling at 11%. And I think that that, that in fact, has shown that there has always been a difference in the way Canadians and the Americans um, approach their politics from the religious perspective and other. That's why I don't think it, I agree with um, Supriya, I don't think it's going to translate here. And I don't think in the conservative race that it has translated in anything concrete for faith communities. But what I was referencing earlier in terms of charities and speaking out is something that's been sought in Canada for quite a while. So what impact do you see it having here, if any? Will it, will it embolden or, or not, those movements? I think you're going to see an emboldened minority within the Conservative caucus, and I think you're already sort of starting to see that. When you look at polling coming out versus who's most in line with Trump's policies, it's always a, it's a minority of Conservative voters, but they're sizable. And there's a reason why people like Kelly Leach have been trying to play the Trump card and by saying they're, you know, the comment section is coming back because there is an appetite for that. However, I just think we have enough of a majority here that is sane that, that won't allow for it to happen. But she was I'm sure you're both trying to get in. I'm sorry, Stephen. We're, <laughs> oh, sorry. we're out of time. That was pretty interesting. Thank you so much, all of you. So women are very much on American author Camille Pali's mind. So is the seeming rise of transgender identity. I'm very concerned okay, about a rush okay, by so many young people to modify the body, okay, to take hormones where they may have unexpected consequences in later life. That's just a taste of what's in store right after the break. While we wait, we're going to take your questions, so why don't we leap in? i got to wear my magic glasses for this. Uh, first question, Marlo turner Ritchie asks, what advice would you give to young women seeking leadership positions? Um, some people say, keep your head down. I say, keep your head up. Be aware of the people ahead of you and the people behind you, and don't, don't toady and don't ignore the people who aren't uh, as powerful, and make it clear what it is that, that you want. Speak up for... Uh, where you want to go and how you want to get there. Um, same message for me. Uh, the next question is from Lucille Barker, who asks, what was the most difficult interview you did and why? Um, I've interviewed lots of prime ministers and even world leaders, um, lots of on Marketplace and other uh, sort of investigative shows that I did was talking to people in sort of big accountability, accusatory interviews, and those were hard. But I think the hardest interview for me as a person was with Jon Stewart because uh, he's kind of a hero of mine as a journalist comedian. And uh, I was thinking that after the interview, you know, we'd go on family holidays together. But he kind of got mad at me because he didn't like my question about had he done this movie because he felt some guilt about getting an Iranian journalist in trouble. So, uh, yeah, we didn't end up best friends after that. So... Um, the next question is from uh, Sarah Marshall, who asks, when you were a reporter, was there ever a time you felt your physical safety was at risk? Not really. Um, I do remember one time I was uh, flying up, to, I was working in Ottawa as a parliamentary correspondent and flew up for Canada Day up to the Dew Line um, with the defence minister, and uh, it was really scary. Uh, there was so much wind, we could barely walk across the tarmac. And uh, years later, the pilot of that flight, working for the government, told me that we should never have taken off, that that was a crazy, <laughs> insane flight. Uh, but no, I have never, I'm not like Adrian Arsenault or any of our other fearless foreign correspondents who have had to basically dodge bullets to get their story to air. Um, 
Uh, Jean-Paul Bedard asks, how do you deal with so many, we get this question a lot, so many heavy topics? How do you manage not to take it home with you at the end of the day? Well, we do feel emotion. Uh, and sometimes I do feel a little bit uh, tearing up in here, but it's not, it's not that we don't care. It's just that that's not really our job is to get personally involved. And when I first started anchoring, we weren't allowed to show emotions at all. But I think the role of anchor has changed a little bit. We're allowed to be almost human now. Um, do you ever feel like crying? Same answer. When did I start working at the CBC? Uh, well, that's classified. <laughs> I started working for the CBC. I actually started working for CTV uh, in Montreal uh, very many years ago. In the early 80s, I went to work for CBC Local in Montreal. Uh, I was really just learning to speak French. Uh, when they asked me at CTV if I could, if I was bilingual, I said yes. I was a girl from Toronto. I kind of lied and I thought, how French could it be? Turns out it's pretty French. So I, uh, I learned. And by the time that I moved to Quebec City for CBC, uh, about, uh, I guess, in the late 80s, and then moved to Ottawa uh, as a parliamentary correspondent. So that's where I ended up. But we are, I'm getting warnings that we're almost out of time. Thank you so much for your questions. For decades, Camille Paglia has had a lot to say about gender, identity, and the feminist movement. Much of it polarizing, even offensive to some. Now the anti-feminist feminist is back in the spotlight, still politically incorrect and provocative, in the Trump era. Paglia believes a backlash against gender politics helped put Donald Trump in the White House. Our conversation in a moment, but first, some background. Beauty is this myth invented in the last 20 years, okay, for, for you know, white heterosexist men in a room, you know, to keep the feminist movement back. Backlash, backlash, backlash. Camille Paglia revels in being provocative. She calls herself an anti-feminist feminist, a transgender person critical of some transgender fights. Paglia burst onto the scene in the early 90s. Her book, Sexual Personae, made her a media sensation, celebrated by her admirers, loathed by her detractors. Camille Paglia, the famous feminist writer, said that I set women back by objectifying myself sexually. For years, she kept pushing buttons on taboo issues of the day, like date rape and gender identity. What I'm saying as a teacher of 22 years, right. experience with dealing with freshmen, is that the date rape hysteria is equally outrageous. Sound familiar? I think that I can dress in a thong and some tights, or maybe not wear any underwear when I'm wearing a skirt, and that not be a consent for me to get raped. Obviously, sexual assault occurs on campus, and it's horrifying. Um, but at what rate is the question. Palia calls herself a prophet and makes her case republishing some of her most controversial essays, calling for an end to male bashing, an end to political correctness on campus, and for women to stop putting themselves in dangerous sexual situations. She details it all in her new book, Free Women, Free Men, Sex, Gender, Feminism. I met up with Camille Palia earlier in Toronto. So nice to meet you. Wonderful to be here again. So feminist flamethrower, you're still at it. You're still having fun? Well, I, you know, I think that m my ideas are getting more currency among certain uh, young people okay, who value freedom, freedom of speech and freedom of action above all. So your book is called Free Women, Free Men, Sex, Gender, Feminism. What does that mean, free women, free men? What are you arguing for? What I'm saying is that each sex has the right to define itself. Right? And we're in a period now where men uh, are the targets of, of far too much uh, blaming. I, I, I want to get the male bashing out of feminism. And I want women to acknowledge that men have a right to determine their own identities too. Uh, it, what, what's happened today is upper middle class career women want to redefine men okay, into what what is what is what operates smoothly in their own now quite affluent career system? So yeah. women are too fixated on careers. I, I'm saying that life is dual, okay, and that uh, that in that in the Anglo-American world, okay, there has been a shift toward looking at your job as a definer of your identity. Once there was the world of women and the world of men. That is not our world right now. But I'm saying, stop, women, stop blaming men 
for your feeling of unhappiness. Okay, what's happened is you've lost that old era, okay, where there was elder care and infant care and cooking and, and doing the laundry. Everything was together. Women were together for tens of thousands of years. Right? So you want women to go back I, to no, doing the laundry? Absolutely not. I'm saying stop blaming men. I'm saying stop blaming men, okay, for your unhappiness. So I'm confused because now you're saying that women have been too hard on men, but you also argue that women are too weak, that they need to be stronger and stand up for themselves, even mm -hmm. in terms of their sexual relationships. Exactly, that's, exactly, okay. What, so it's kind of confusing. What you have now is, is a, a certain style, okay, a bourgeois style, upper middle class style of, of, of self-presentation by women, okay, all right, that is compliant, that is decorous, that is feminine. It's an entire reversion to the Doris Day, all right, and, and Debbie Reynolds era that I revolted against, okay, so my philosophy of street smart Amazon feminism is about putting personal responsibility onto women. Every single moment of every day, okay, you have a responsibility to project to men and to other women what you will tolerate and what you will not. Stop looking to daddy figures and mommy figures, okay, on grievance committees and so on, uh, or the government, okay, to get you out of jams. Life is difficult, okay, you know, step up, step up to the plate. You don't think there's a problem with sexual assault? Because a lot of women no, are coming I, forward now, no, and, I, and no, in cases of real rape, of course should be prosecuted. Of course, real rape, okay, is a crime. But this is not real rape. We've been we've been arguing about dating encounters of mi and with miscommunications now for decades. Okay, it's absolutely infantilizing to women. It must stop. But you know that a lot of women are afraid of sexual assault or have been sexually assaulted. Um, should they not be able to go and? drink and play beer pong and get drunk like the guys do? They live in fear. If you go to a fraternity house party all right, with a chaos going on in the living room area and a, a young man says to you, would you like to go up to my room? I'm sorry, okay, you are consenting to sex. He is right to think you have consented, okay, to go up there and so change your mind and so on, right? It's not right, of course, for anyone to impose themselves sexually on, on another person, uh, naturally, okay? But women must realize they are now free. The sexual revolution has been won. It's up to them to decide what do they want? And I, again, I say, act like a gay man does. Okay? M m many gay men have horrible experiences okay, and so on, but they want sexual adventure. Why are we coddling young women okay, to say, go on being uh, you know, children? No, because mommy and daddy will be there to pick up the pieces for you afterward. Should, I guess the argument is made that shouldn't, it be, shouldn't men be afraid of the consequences of of we have not laws. getting consent? We have laws on the books, okay, against rape, okay. All right. But the point is right now, okay. But everybody in that world will tell you it's almost impossible to, for, for women to, to have the strength to come forward, to make the case, and oh, so on. Oh, Lord, okay. I, 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 we're going to go on like this, making endless excuses for middle class girls, okay, confused, unsure of what they want, okay. I mean, perhaps the sexual revolution should be reversed, okay, because it, what, what we're showing is that perhaps co education is a bad idea, okay. Maybe, maybe today's young women. Women, okay, are not prepared for co-education. You think that's where this leading is? Yes, I, yes, it is. Okay, we reverted to the 1950s with this, for heaven's sakes. Okay, All right. Again, my code of Amazonism says, okay, every woman is responsible for her own self, for her own sexuality. You are responsible. Stop thinking there's going to be parent figures to get you out of jams afterward. You decide what you want. Okay, something happens to you. Okay, you learn from it and you move on. The other huge debate on campus these days, of course, is political correctness and people who are extreme, seen as extreme right wing are being banned from speaking or there's, there's protests. What, where do you stand on that? I'm extreme free speech militant. Okay? I so believe anybody can, can preach hate and that's, they should be welcomed onto campus? Well, that was a loaded question. You said preach hate. Hate. What does that mean? Okay, I, I, I say in the introduction to, to the new book, okay, Free Women, Free Men, I say that, 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 that the freedom to love, okay, must also be balanced by the freedom to hate, okay? Anyone may express through words, okay, what, it, 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 hate, okay? It, it is when hate passes over into action, okay, that, that the law should intervene, okay? Merely expressing a negative opinion of gay people, for example, and I'm speaking as a lesbian, okay, is not hate speech. I want this idea of hate speech, okay, to be dropped completely. We have to take a short break, but when we come back, 
You heard Camille Palia describe herself as a lesbian, but she also describes herself another way. I consider myself transgender. I, I have never identified at all with being a woman. That is, the, in fact, the, that is the inspiration, really, of my work. You've been quoted saying that the transgender bathroom bill actually helped get Trump elected, that mm -hmm. there was a backlash against that. Really? Yes. It was in the closing months, okay, of the, of the campaign, and all of a sudden the Obama administration blundered into that, okay? Uh, and that, that seemed to crystallize right, exactly this kind of, uh, you know, top to bottom uh, movement that was been, that's been going on in the United States. People, people just had enough, okay, of, um, you know, of a bunch of, of you know, urban, uh, liberal Democrats deciding what's bad 
best okay for for bathrooms in, in, in rural and you know communities across the United States. And that, that was just that, it was too far. It was too much. Too far. They were trying to reinterpret okay a law that's been on the books you know for decades. Okay, Title IX to to re, redefine uh, what gender is. Okay, the, the, the meaning of gender. So do you think that those bathrooms are wrong? No, I think I think it's a, a great um, step forward to have gender neutral bathrooms. I mean, we, we after all we have them on planes and, and so on. Um, but at the same time, I don't. I, you have to realize there's another part of this, okay? Which is that do uh, people who, who who declare themselves to be a different gender today feel, okay, have the right to enter a locker room, okay, with <laughs> with 12 year old, 14 year old girls undressing? Okay, that was a completely separate issue, okay? But it it, it got rolled up into this, so people just revolted uh, against the establishment, okay? I, so I think it did play a role in um, in Trump's uh, election. It's fascinating because you've been writing about not bathrooms, but you've been writing about gender identity issues forever. Exactly, because I, I consider myself transgender. I, I have never identified at all with being a woman. That is the, in fact, the, that is the inspiration, of, really, of my work. I was the first person to be writing about androgyny. That was the subject of my of papers in college, of my dissertation, sexual persona. The whole thing is about androgyny, okay? Uh, and I and I am um, kind of an alien being in, 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 gen, in gender terms. I really So isn't I'm it a good thing, then, that people are having these no, discussions? No, I, no, I think the current transgender movement is full of Confusion. Okay, um, I think that my philosophy, okay, of the of persona, okay, is much broader. Okay, I have much more to say about uh, about being a dissident, a gender dissident, than than the current rhetoric does. Okay, I'm saying that many transgender people, okay, uh, who believe that their sense of alienation is coming simply from the gender issue, I may be mistaken. Okay, that they, they they may be dissidents in many other ways. So I'm very concerned. Okay, about a rush. Okay, by so many young people. People, to modify the body, okay, to take hormones where that may have unexpected consequences in later life, to, to make to make permanent changes in the body, to have to have breast removal and, and penis removal so, so early on. Okay, I, I offer a far more fluid and flexible, uh, you know, a position in regards to uh, transgender um, tra the transgender critique of, of the gender system. So where's it going to go? Uh, I don't know, but I, but um, I, I'm asking for I, I don't want special protections for for gays or transgender. I'm saying there should be protections for all dissident behavior and speech, dissidents of every kind. Okay, that is the way the law should go. Before we sat down, you told me that you were uh, getting a little older and slowing down. You don't seem like you're really oh. slowing down. <laughs> it's Italian <laughs> Italian DNA, I, I, I think. It's been so well, great to talk so to you. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> if you were struck by our interview with Camille Paglia, we've got a wealth of thought-provoking conversations and more on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash cbcthenational and subscribe. And please do give us feedback. Of course, provocative talk by and about women long predated YouTube. Just ahead, this week's look back, feminist style. That's next on The National. The problems were removed when the... Strangely, radio tape also plays a vital part in the television newscast. A reporter working on a story may not always be able to gather together all his facts in time to film a report. To overcome this, he will direct the shooting of silent film to illustrate the story and will later record his own voice track on ordinary broadcast tape. Cal. This bit with Borgo about the uh, reaction, differing reaction between French Canadians and English Canadians. The radio and television newsrooms work closely on many stories. Sound from a film is often re-recorded for radio broadcast use, and conversely, radio tapes frequently are used to provide commentary for a particular piece of film. I think, personally, that um, uh, General de Gaulle has a good foreign policy most of the time, uh, as most Frenchmen Agree on As you get it's some the uh, contrasting States action from the French Canadians on one side and the English Canadians on the other. Uh, All right, well, we'll get that put on the desk and we can run that. One night that in North America. Perhaps over some man in the street in the runabout city hall when the goal is here. That might be good. Fine, thanks, Tom. Out in the city, cameramen and reporters are following a fast breaking news story. which at any time can take an unpredictable turn.
Two hours to go, and the motorcycle messenger arrives unexpectedly with some late film. Again, the lineup order is changed to permit the inclusion of this new item. Uh, Dickie, is that film from Quebec ready yet? Oh, not till then, eh? Well, I can't wait. Okay, bye bye. The final splice is made in the film. It is cleaned and wound onto the reel. That Austrian balloon team is going to take another trip on Friday. Many people express surprise at learning that a newscast for television is rehearsed. The reason for this is that each program must begin and end on a precise second. Because of this, every item must be timed and the duration of each film checked under actual studio conditions to provide an accurate count. The announcer can familiarize himself with the script. Last minute changes can be made, a word deleted or added to improve the sense, and material eliminated to ensure perfect timing. Even so, the rehearsal provides nothing like the preparation of other types of television programs. Our Canada is a land of many stories. The flag designed around the maple leaf. From the past. She was a tough girl. To the present. Dust. From coast to coast to coast. This year. We must grasp it together. Share your experiences. That's what I love about the North. Your stories. Today I've become a Canadian citizen. Your Canada. It's everything that I think about. Join us. Oh, oh that is cold. CBC. Home to 2017. Earlier, you heard Camille Paglia's take on how Donald Trump has impacted feminism. Her work is thought-provoking. It also reminds us of past battles won and future battles to come. So tonight, we look back at feminist icons, the trailblazers and firebrands of the movement. A year ago, this woman heaved a brick through the rose-colored picture window of the American suburban bungalow and invited the resident housewife to take a clear look at the outside world. And you know, in many ways, it's more revolutionary to regard woman as simply another human being without any mystique than all of the rights that we won on paper many years ago and which, unfortunately, too few women have really used. You see, the feminine mystique has made us feel it's unfeminine to use our rights. You know, what kind of, what kind of girl is she? She seems like a real bitch. <laughs> but what I've uh, come to understand lately is it's not always personal. It is, is that all women come in for this kind of stuff? Because I keep meeting women who I've heard all my life are bitchy and pushy and so on and so forth. I meet them and they're, they're nice, compassionate people. It's, if, if you don't play your role, you know, if you dare to aspire to something, then, then you get it automatically. I don't mind them consorting with truck drivers. The question is what truck drivers like to have neurotic women like you. You think uh, I'm a neurotic woman? Well, it's a lot of truck drivers would be very uptight. Assessment. Why should you think that? I have controlled myself all the time in this situation. I have not insulted either of you, whatever uh, my but, private opinions right, may be fine. about I'm you. And saying... you have both. He has called my friends, he has called the women I work with by every filthy name he could lay his tongue to without being bleeped out. Yep, I cannot sorry, have you sitting here that's distorting my book for the people who are foolish enough to think that you know about things. All right, what, what did you I say about the truck driver? What I actually said yeah. was... The woman who is going to university who's actually got a chance to read Marx, who's actually got a chance to figure out the way the world is organized, which is difficult enough, had better justify that privilege and the money spent on her by turning those advantages back to the people who haven't got them. I think that feminism has suffered from having the agenda be perceived as overloaded and uh, being hijacked by the left. A feminism that motivates all women of every background across the political spectrum to say, hey, I'm entitled to get in on this conversation is a much more effective guarantee of women's rights than a situation which everyone believes what I believe. And that's The National for this Sunday night.
I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching. And for news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca.